Being occupied by the Germans was normally a distressingly unpleasant experience. They got rid of your own government, installed their own leaders, often gave obscure right-wing nationalists high positions over their own people and relentlessly terrorised the nations via the Gestapo, the SD and other security agencies of the Nazi state. The Germans also imprisoned or shipped out to concentration camps or worse, large numbers of citizens who didn't fit the racial or religious laws of Germany. And they also took many of your citizens as forced labourers to other parts of Hitler's empire. If your country was defeated and occupied by the Germans in World War II, the average citizen had four main choices. Keep your head down and try to continue your life as before, putting up with all the Germans' rules. Or, secondly, actively fighting the Germans by joining some kind of resistance organisation. Or thirdly, passive resistance, doing whatever you could to resist without confronting the Germans head-on. And lastly, there was collaboration, which came in many forms, and normally was the least attractive route for most people. So what about national leaders faced with German occupation? They were naturally targets for the Germans, and to stay put often involved being taken as a political prisoner by the SS or even murdered. Many fled their nations and went into exile, mostly in London, forming governments in exile and helping the Allied war effort. Some collaborated with the Germans. But what about the kings and queens of these nations facing occupation? Many also fled into exile. Very few stayed put. But one monarch in particular decided to stay in his own country with his own people for the duration of the war, the monarch of the tiny European country of Denmark, King Christian X. By staying, the king, whose relationship with Hitler was difficult to say the least, earned his subjects everlasting respect. The king offered a unique form of passive resistance, and his continual presence confounded the German occupation authorities and personally annoyed Hitler. For the Nazis, occupation policies were often crafted on a system of leeway. The Germans treated some occupied nations differently from others. The harsh and homicidal German occupation of Poland was not practiced in Denmark, the Germans viewing the Danes as fellow Aryans. Like many other European countries, even little Denmark had its share of Hitler fellow travellers, as some Danes felt strongly enough about Soviet communism to even take up arms in German uniform and fight on the Eastern Front. But the numbers were quite small in comparison with the overall population. Denmark fell to German forces on the 9th of April 1940, even though a neutral nation. It was attacked and occupied as part of the wider German plan to conquer Norway and secure access to raw materials vital for armaments production coming via neutral Sweden. The Germans also wanted to get rid of the British, French and Polish forces in Norway. The outnumbered and poorly equipped Danish forces offered patchy resistance, and being in a very disadvantageous geographical position and with a small population, the Danes could not hope to prevent the Wehrmacht from occupying their country. The Danish government, believing that further military resistance was futile and a waste of Danish lives, capitulated. Denmark was turned into a German protectorate, and the Germans operated a fairly relaxed policy, allowing the same Danish government to continue in power as before, though under German auspices. Instead of a Nazi governor-general, Hitler appointed a Reich plenipotentiary, a diplomatic post to deal with Danish affairs. The Danish police and the judicial system remained under Danish control. However, under German pressure, the Danish government had to accommodate Nazi wishes. Newspaper articles critical of the Germans were outlawed. Following the German invasion of the USSR in June 1941, the government announced the arrest of Danish communists, and Denmark joined the anti comintern pact alongside Finland, becoming a German ally against the Soviet Union. Danish economic interests became gradually tied to those of Germany, but on the plus side, the Danish government rejected Berlin's push to begin persecuting Danish Jews. The German military was not given judicial powers over Danish citizens. A much-reduced Danish army of 2,200 men was retained, largely to guard the king's palace. And secretly, many Danish soldiers started to gather intelligence for the British. 
a Danish resistance movement was founded, but due to the small size of the country, its operations were very difficult. Though during World War II, Danish resistance operatives killed around 400 Danish collaborators, Danish Nazis and informers, and helped Allied intelligence activities tremendously. For the king, he had stayed put when the country surrendered, and though he had made mistakes earlier in his reign, primarily in 1920, when he had dissolved a democratically elected government that he had disagreed with, precipitating a constitutional crisis and widespread protests, and had been forced to become only a symbolic head of state thereafter. Twenty years later, the elderly king became a symbol of resistance to German occupation, by a very unique method. Born in 1870, the eldest son of Crown Prince Frederick of Denmark, later King Frederick VIII, his mother was Princess Louise of Sweden. His wife was a German-Russian royal, Princess Alexandrina of Mecklenburg-Schwerin. Christian came to the throne of Denmark in 1912, age 41. With the German occupation in 1940, Christian's official speeches basically towed the line of his government but Danes saw him as a man of mental resistance. And the greatest expression of the king's resistance was something Christian did every day during the first two years of German occupation. He would dress in full Danish army uniform and mounted atop one of his horses. He would ride out of the palace and alone through the streets of Copenhagen. He was not accompanied by a groom or any mounted escort. Absolutely no security whatsoever, only the sword he wore as part of his uniform. And in this defiant manner, the king would trot along the city streets, acknowledging his people with endless salutes, followed by flocks of boys on bicycles, every day, come rain or shine, to show his people that their king was still there and that Denmark still had its own identity. The people loved the spectacle, and the defiant message of the lonely king resplendent atop his charger spread and metal badges of the king's arms soon became a sort of passive resistance icon to the Danes. The people who wore the badges did so to show that they were loyal Danes. Sadly, Hitler's softly, softly approach to the Danes didn't last. In 1942, Hitler sent Christian a long telegram congratulating him on his 72nd birthday. The king's reply was terse and short, one sentence, quote, giving my best wishes, King Christian, unquote. Hitler took the reply to mean something else involving having carnal relations with oneself, and the telegram crisis was born. Hitler recalled his ambassador to Denmark and threw out the Danish ambassador to Berlin. The Germans then removed the Danish government and replaced it by people they thought would be more friendly to them. On the 19th of October 1942, King Christian, during one of his rides, fell from his horse, sustaining injuries that kept him from riding in public pretty much to the end of his life. On the 29th of August 1943, after several incidents, the Germans dissolved the Danish parliament and declared martial law, taking over the administration of the country entirely. One of the main actions was the round-up of Copenhagen's Jewish population. However, when the SS and security police raided Jewish homes, almost everyone was gone. Incredibly, 8,000 Jews had been smuggled to neutral Sweden, smuggled out by non-Jewish Danes who disagreed with Nazi policy. The king had also played his part in this escape, providing funds for the effort. 95% of Denmark's Jews therefore survived the Holocaust. In May 1945, Denmark was liberated by British troops under Field Marshal Sir Bernard Montgomery. As in every liberated city, the people of Copenhagen welcome the Allied troops. The world has seen such scenes of joy in France, in Belgium and Holland. And now it is the turn of the people of Denmark. Sheets of music are printed and distributed. Soldier salute soldier. This is the comradeship of free peoples. 
King Christian arrives for the reopening of the Danish parliament. With a democratic constitution, all parties are represented under the leadership of this well-loved monarch. All through the occupation, he inspired his people. His faith in allied victory never faltered. His faith is justified today. Many thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share. And also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below. Thank you.